Welcome everyone. Congratulations to the organisers. Congratulations to everyone for coming. But above all, congratulations to the PCS for delivering such a successful strike today. And as a member, I mean, I know that everyone's been engaged in the PCS and there's been a collective leadership, but as a member of the General Secretaries Club, I'd like to pay special compliment to Mark Rosigan. Um, he's, he's a class act in both senses of the term. And uh, a few years ago, when they were threatening to take away a number of public sector pensions, Mark, myself, the NUT and a few others, those who were meeting in the awkward squad, um, managed to turn them round. We may not have got everything, and indeed the next generation has to fight for some of the pensions benefits that this generation had managed to secure. But it was, a, it was a great success and it was based on an alliance and political leadership. Well, we've had 10 years of Blair. On the surface, it's been pretty disappointing. And underneath it all, it's been totally disastrous. <laughs> Do you remember? I remember Chill going down my spine when he said, let us reorder this world. And look what a mess he's made of it. He said the hidden hand of history was on his shoulder. Well, it should have given him a shove a bit earlier. <laughs> and if we run through his famous quotes, actually, if you're stuck up a cul-de-sac like Iraq, you do need a reverse gear. We don't just need a change of leader, we need a total change of direction or else we'll just have a whole new lot of reshuffled Labour MPs to blame. So when John MacDonald, or whoever else, is elected leader, uh, we expect them to announce in their acceptance speech something which shows a total change of direction. That May the 1st will be a public holiday whatever day of the week it falls upon. In addition to the first Monday in May, unless, of course, May the 1st is a Sunday, in which case we should have the Tuesday as well. <laughs> Along with this, we need an end to privatisation and private-public partnerships and almost anything else that this government's come up beginning with P, except for progressive taxation, which we want to see. We want to see, instead of donations from entrepreneurs to schools and colleges, from people who don't pay any tax in this country, like Sir Philip Green, who paid himself 1.2 billion. We want to see him paying tax of around 400,000 at least, preferably more, and then we won't have to be pathetically grateful when he gives us a couple of million to set up a new academy. <laughs> We want to see de decent public housing, affordable public housing, investment in public services rather than trident. We want a rigorous campaign by the government against the BNP rather than the sort of Islamophobia and Muslim bashing that we've seen of recent times. When I was a child, they used to tell us that in the Soviet Union, children were told to report on their parents. Well, John Reed told Muslim parents to shop their children to the police. I mean, he's not someone you'd have around to babysit, is he? <laughs> and if there was something of the night about Michael Howard, there's far too much of the dawn raid about John Reed. <laughs> we need positive rights to withdraw labour. Only slaves can't withdraw their labour, yet in this country unions have to negotiate an impossible obstacle course to even come within the possibilities of their members taking lawful industrial action. And the first start to that should be the full implementation of the Trade Union Freedom Bill, though actually that doesn't go far enough. We want to see more than lip service paid to equal pay. We want all employers 
required to institute equal pay audits and to act on them if they show there is an equal pay. <laughs> and we want an end to the 2% pay freeze which has been instituted. And above all else, we want the withdrawal of troops immediately from Afghanistan and Iraq. And from our union's point of view, we want to see the reinstatement of free ESOL lessons, English for speakers of other languages. And I'll say a few words on this last item, and it will be the, the, the point of what I'm going to say tonight, because it kind of sums up what's been happening in adult education with 800,000 places lost, registered places lost in the last year. We've seen Bill Rammel say that he will end free courses for migrant workers, refugees and asylum seekers unless they are claiming benefits. They all cost about £1,000 a year if they're full-time courses, plus, of course, childcare, travel, etc., etc. £450 a year if they're six hours a week courses. And this 80% of migrant workers earn less than £6 a week. And only 3% of migrant workers actually claim the benefit which would entitle them to free courses. Now, it's not surprising because actually you have to fill out, I mean, Mark can correct me on this, a form which is almost 20 pages long, and when I looked at it on the internet, impenetrable, in order to get the qualification which would then give you free ESOL courses. A, a, a well-meaning bloke from the DFES met with a group, uh, that's the Department for Education and Skills, met with a group of trade unionists to discuss how we could, uh, what could be done in terms of these ESOL cuts. And when he learnt the message that... Uh, there was a long form, uh, he said, well, how can we help these migrant workers fill out the form? <laughs> and you can imagine that the cry from around the room was reinstate free ESOL. The, I can't find anyone who says it's a good idea other than government ministers and Bill Rammel, the Minister for Lifelong Learning. Even the government's own skills czar, Digby Jones, who was uh, leader of the CBI, says he's opposed to it. Now, Bill says it's all right, employers will pay, they'll be paying something. Well, if farmers in Lincolnshire, where there are 60,000 Polish migrant workers, are going to pay to get their workers out of the sort of vulnerable isolation they're in, I'll be very surprised. And there's no queues of people with little bags of money outside colleges in London to ensure that people, that they have the resource to put on the courses. In fact, London is going to be the hardest hit and women are going to be the hardest hit. And it's a matter of life and death. The cockle pickers, as the tide was coming over them, were phoning up China to get emergency services because they did not know how to get emergency services in Britain. The Olympic Games has been sold in London on the basis of multiculturalism, yet it's under attack everywhere, and ESOL is just a symbol of this. The OECD, which looks at economic performances, has examined the UK economic performance, which you'll recall Gordon Brown always says is the longest and most successful and so on and so forth, and said the hidden secret of that is migrant workers. Yet all we are asking is that he top up their secondary education and primary education, which has been paid by their home countries. And this is racist, what's going on. If someone comes to a college and says, I'd like, to do a call, I'd like to learn to read and write, please, our members will have to say, one minute, could you just say that again? You sound a bit foreign. Uh, I'm afraid you have to go that way and pay. And if someone comes along with literacy problems, they go that way and it's still free. Now, closes, sources close to the government, uh, including uh, Jack Straw, apparently, have suggested that there should be an English test on entry to the country. Now, it's an absurd idea, and it will never take off, but it has given me an idea, and that is that anyone who wishes, any English person who wishes to go abroad, ought to take a test in the language of the country they're going to. And... 
And if they want to go bearing arms, it should be a particularly rigorous test. And that, if that had been applied a few years ago, we wouldn't have had an invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq. Indeed, if it had been applied 200 years ago, there would have been no need for William Wilberforce, and we could have avoided all the pain and misery of the British Empire. I think I've got one other message to make tonight, which is that the critical importance in unions of a cadre of politically aware trade union reps. There's often a focus in unions on sort of individual assistance and so on and so forth. I know from when I was a regional official, if you haven't got strong workplace organisation with people who have nous, the most silver-tongued advocate in the world will not be able to defend your members. So, welcome to May Day. Welcome to, to what is the European Year of opportunity, Equal Opportunities. Uh, I hope in terms of ESOL in September what we'll see is mass registration at the colleges, protests and occupations if they can't get the courses that they want. I've got one month more as Joint General Secretary and then to pinch a one-liner from Tony Benn, I'm going to give up being a trade union bureaucrat in order to concentrate more time on militant trade unionism. Thank you.